and to pray and to comfort those who have suffered. So we'll have a moment silent, then I'll pray. Thus says the Lord, a voice was heard in Ramah, lamentation and bitter weeping, Rachel weeping for her children, <coughs> refusing to be comforted for her children because they are no more. Thus says the Lord, refrain your voice from weeping, your eyes from tears, for your work shall be rewarded, says the Lord, and they shall come back from the land of the enemy. There is hope in your future, says the Lord, that your children shall come back to their own border. Lord, we do pray for those who have suffered terrible loss. Pray for those who are still suffering, those who are hostages, those who are grieving over lost loved ones, those who are injured, those who are frightened of what's coming, those who are going to war, those who are in war. Lord, we bring all these people before you, both Jewish, Arab, whatever they are, Lord. You love them. You came to give them peace and yet they find themselves in the midst of war. Lord, have mercy. Help them, Lord, at this time, we pray. In the name of Yeshua, Jesus, our Messiah, Savior and Lord. Amen. 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 Please be seated. Just before I give the talk, I just want to give a reading from 2 Chronicles, chapter 15. 2 Chronicles chapter 15. This is a word given to Arza, who was one of the good kings of Israel, of Judah. It says, Now the Spirit of God came upon Azariah, the son of Oded, and he went out to meet Arza and said to him, Hear me, Arza, and all Judah and Benjamin. The Lord is with you while you are with him. If you seek him, he will be find, found by you. But if you forsake him, he will forsake you. For a long time Israel has been without the true God, without a teaching priest and without law. But when in their trouble they turned to the Lord God of Israel and sought him, he was found by them. And in those times there was no peace to the one who went out, nor to the one who came in. But great turmoil was on all the inhabitants of the lands. So nation was destroyed by nation and city by city, for God troubled them with every adversity. But you be strong and do not let your hands be weak, for your work shall be rewarded." When Arza heard these words and the prophecy of Oded the prophet, he took courage and removed the idols from all the land of Judah and Benjamin and from the cities which he had taken in the mountains of Ephraim, and he restored the altar of the Lord that was before the vestibule of the Lord. And he gathered all Judah and Benjamin and those who dwelt with them from Ephraim, Manasseh, and Simeon, and they came over to him in great numbers from Israel when they saw that the Lord God was with him. Just a prophecy given to a king at that time but there's a message to us as well here was Arza a king who was turning to the Lord and he, God said to him be strong don't forsake the Lord he will be with you it says also that for a long time they've been without a teaching priest and without the law and without the true God and we can see that that's the state for Israel for us here in the west and for all the nations of the world and what they need is to hear a teaching priest, a true priest, preaching the word of God. And they need to hear the word of God. They need to turn back to the Lord. That's the only way they can find the answer to the problems which are coming on the world today. And it speaks kind of about the situation then, but you can see it's a bit prophetic about our times. In those times there was no peace to the one who went out, nor to the one who came in, but great turmoil was upon all the inhabitants of the land. 
Nation was destroyed by nation, city by city, for God troubled them with every adversity. You can see that's what's happening in the world, isn't it? Nation against nations, people rising up against other, being troubled by every adversity. And what does God say? Panic and give up? No, he says, you be strong. Do not let your hands be weak, for your work will be rewarded. And there is a place where we can be strong, we can stand for the Lord, stand for his truth in these days, and not to let our faith waver, but to continue and to believe God, and believe that he's going to have the ultimate answer, which would be for good. And even in the midst of evil and shuffling and strife, we know that there is a hope for the future to those who call upon the Lord. And hope for Israel, hope for the Middle East, hope for the Western world, hope for Russia, for China, for all these nations that are now in such great turmoil. There's a hope, but there's only one hope in God who made us, who's redeemed us in the person of Yeshua, and who one day is going to judge the world in righteousness according to his word. Praise the Lord. So let's have a look at our subject for tonight. This month in prophecy, and I've titled this The Eve of Destruction, which is not a very encouraging title, but I was just reminded of a song which, uh, if you're older as I was in the 60s, you may remember it, by a singer called Barry Maguire called The Eve of Destruction. He said, you tell me over and over again, my friend, how you don't believe we're on the eve of destruction. Well, that was 60 years ago, and you could say Barry got it wrong because we're still here 60 years later, just about. But now it seems we really could be on the eve of destruction. You look around you, you see the things which are happening, which are threatening the future of the human race. I get a lot of uh, sources I get my information from. One of them is something called the Medium Daily Digest, kind of interesting website. I would say the influence behind it is kind of left of center, humanist, not religious. Very criti- American, very critical of Donald Trump and of Putin, basically in favor of what you might call the liberal world order. But it has some interesting information. And this was an article which I came across by a man called Wes O'Donnell. See what he says. Maybe it's just me, but it doesn't, doesn't it feel like something bad is on the horizon? Look, my articles are typically optimistic. I'll leave the doom writing and the doom scrolling to others, like Tony Pierce. But it feels like we are collectively experiencing a sense of dread for some sort of impending trial or tribulation. In my 40 years of life, I don't think I've ever felt anything like it. It could be nothing, or it could be the beginning of the end for global civilization. This is what worries me in no particular order. Russian aggression in Ukraine triggering NATO, Article 5, Iranian aggression against Israel via Hamas and Hezbollah, Chinese invasion of Taiwan because the US is distracted, artificial general intelligence that becomes self-aware, complete and total political dysfunction in the United States, climate change, full UAP, that stands for Unidentified Aerial Phenomena, which also means UFO, disclosure. Trump too, Trump returning to the White House. They don't like Trump, by the way. This time he's mad as hell and he's not going to take it anymore. COVID the sequel, sequel, COVID two or the next bug. This time it's also mad and hell as hell and it's not going to take it anymore. He goes on to say, as rich and powerful as the United States is, there are events which, which, when combined, would break the country that has led the liberal world order since 1945. Liberal world order, which is rooted in values like democracy, human rights, and free trade, is at risk. What about three simultaneous wars? U.S. military stockpile is already straining from Ukrainian support, and military is experiencing the worst recruiting crisis since the post-Vietnam War. If the U.S. gets tied up with both Ukraine and Israel, China's Xi Jinping may believe the U.S. is distracted enough to be unable to respond to a surprise invasion of Taiwan. If it happens, I expect North Korea to attack South Korea, Iran to invade Israel. Now we're in a global war. It goes on to speak about killer robots, AI being developed to harm humanity, as well as the evidence of UFOs uh, affecting humans on the Earth. Uh, dealt with AI in the past. I'll leave the UFO one for now, but I have got some information on that one, which I may give you at some time. But generally, what do you think about it? If you look around, there's a note from the, what do you call the Western-based global globalists, like the World Economic Forum people we've talked about in the past, who are getting into a kind of panic, thinking that actually their agenda's unraveling, not going to come to pass. It's all going to fall apart. 
and an alternative world order or disorder may come about, led by Russia, by China. The BRICS nations are noticing a glowing alliance of rogue dictatorships like Russia, China, Iran, North Korea. Now, all this is coming together, and uh, we're just going to go through a few events before we get on to Israel. I'm not going to speak about Israel, not so much at the moment, but uh, just to mention that, to be honest, I've found the last three weeks actually chronically painful. I don't know about you, but I can hardly bear to watch the news. Um, and just the shock of seeing this terrible attack on Israel by Hamas, and more Jewish people actually killed in a single day than any other event since the Holocaust terrible event. And we have a great empathy with Israel and Jewish friends suffering loss and trauma at what's happened. And we're going to have a look at it in a bit more detail in a moment. But let's have a look at one or two other issues which are taking place around us. Russia and Ukraine. The Ukraine war is dragging on. A lot of evidence of demoralization of the Russian army. Read reports of Russian soldiers who've been wounded in conflict and just being left to die when their lives could easily be saved by getting them out of the conflict zone, but the Russians just don't bother or they don't care or they don't have the means to do that. Uh, any other army, British army, American army, and certainly the Israeli army, would do what they can to take their wounded soldiers out and to treat them. And there's a mixture of brutality and humanity and total incompetence in the Russian army, which is affected by the whole political system. There's no breakthroughs in what's happening in Ukraine, though they're minor advances by Ukraine. Russia is at presently taking advantage of the world attention on the Middle East crisis to launch new attacks in Ukraine, and they're hoping that the West will tire of supporting Ukraine and give them the advantage, then they can take what they want from Ukraine. Meanwhile, there have been warnings of nuclear war which have come from Moscow, quite credible ones. On October the 8th, Putin ordered Russia's first nationwide nuclear attack exercise across 11 time zones in preparation for a potential nuclear war. On the 26th, Russia's military conducted a simulated nuclear strike in a drill overseen by President Putin hours after the upper house of parliament voted to rescind the country's ratification of the global nuclear test ban. Russia's Minister of Defense, Sergei Shogai, said the purpose of the drill was to practice dealing with a massive nuclear strike by the enemy. Now, since the West is not going to attack Russia unless it's attacked by Russia first, does that mean Russia is preparing something? Well, the Russian regime is not exactly stable at this present time, but it's a sobering thought. It goes on to say China. China is continually massing forces of its coastal military base facing Taiwan. Taiwan's defense ministry issued a report on the expansion of Chinese airfields and military activity on its doorstep, saying China began probing Taiwan territory on a near daily basis. Um, China's got its own problems financially, but <coughs> It's a strong and powerful country, and in theory should be able to overrun uh, Taiwan quite easily, unless America enters the war, in which case you're into a possible nuclear war between America and China. Taiwan actually does have a number of missiles, and one report I said that if they fire their missiles at the Chinese mainland and manage to hit the Three Gorges Dam over the Yangtze River, it would cause a flood, which would flood the whole of downstream China, Around 200 million people would die. Wuhan and Shanghai would be wiped off the map, and most of Shanghai, China's agricultural base would be gone. Meanwhile, Russia and China are getting together with an alternative world order program confronting the West, bringing other bad actors into the situation, including the Iranian Islamic regime, North Korea, and aiming actually to remove the dollar as the world reserve currency end the petrodollar system, and if they're successful in doing this, it would actually cause the collapse of the US economy. That may be going to happen anyway. Uh, global debt has hit a record $307 trillion in the second quarter of this year. US debt hit $33 trillion, rising by about $1 trillion every six months. If the US can't resolve the funding crisis to raise the debt level next month, it won't be able to pay its employees Banks and businesses across the U.S. are already closing. Crisis is only just beginning. This is not sustainable and sooner or later will lead to an economic crisis which will make the events of 2008 look like a picnic. China, too, is in great deep trouble economically as the collapsing of its housing market has left debt everywhere 
and it's unable to pay its pensions or civil servants. Could be heading our way as well. Article in the paper here says a toxic, toxic cocktail of conflict, debt, and Biden's trillion dollar splurge means a financial tsunami is heading our way. Africa's plagued by wars and military coups along with poverty and bad governance, while in Central and South America, drug gangs are destabilizing countries, bringing death and misery to millions. Approximately 820 million people, or 10% of the world's population, find themselves in a state of chronic hunger. Numbers growing as a result of the Ukraine war, climate disasters, poor harvests, adding to famine conditions for many. And desperate people are looking for refuge through illegal migration into the developed world, mainly into USA or Europe, but increasingly these countries are not able to absorb them and are facing economic and social crises themselves. Finally, we've got strange weather, natural disasters, raising the demand from the UN and global bodies for more measures to put in place to save the world from catastrophic climate change. There are some questions to be asked, I'm not gonna go into this at this moment, about the science behind the green agenda, but whether it's true or not, the potential for the net zero project is to bring about further economic and social decline in countries like ours. Projected the US, the UK cost of going over to net zero by 2050 is around three trillion. It would cost the UK economy one pound for every second for the next 31,000 years. As we don't have this money, either the project will be ditched, which is unlikely, as it's written into law and supported by our political leaders and demanded by the global powers, it's likely we'll end up poorer, hungrier, colder, unable to travel, and also unable to criticize the program because they'll be censoring the internet. Without in adequate power and money available, many of the systems which societies like ours rely on will no longer function properly. Those are a few of the things happening. Uh, am I exaggerating? Is it true or not true? Now, if we could see that our governments or opposition parties even had an answer to all this, we could have some hope. But by and large, they don't. <laughs> now, Jesus said that in the last days, you're going to see certain things happening. There's going to be a crisis in the world which will bring this age to an end. If you read through his prophecy in Matthew 24, you can see that, in brief, the sequence of events is in three stages. There's the first stage, which is prime, pretty much tying up with what's happening now. Uh, he says, you will hear of wars and rumors of wars, see that you're not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. The nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There'll be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. Second stage which follows that is what we call the Great Tribulation Period. In verse 21, he says, For then there will be great tribulation, such as has not been since the beginning of the world until this time, no nor ever shall be. And unless those days were shortened, no flesh will be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days will be shortened. In other words, that's going to be a short time, but if it didn't, wasn't shortened, then no flesh would be saved. I said this before, but if no flesh would be saved, it means no life would be saved. It would be the end of life on earth. So you have a situation there which is going to rise up, which could bring potentially the end of life on earth. It won't because God still has a program for the earth, which is going to be the thousand-year reign of the Messiah after his return. So he's going to preserve Israel. He's going to preserve the church. He's going to preserve the world until his second coming. By the church, he's going to preserve at least people who believe in Jesus. Then you go on to verse 29. It says, immediately after the tribulation of those days, this is the third stage, by the way, uh, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, the stars will fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven, then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. That's the third stage. Son of Man coming with power and great glory. Who's the Son of Man? It's Jesus. How is he coming this time? Not as a suffering servant, coming this time as King of Kings and Lord of Lords with power and great glory to put right all the mess which humans have made of the world he gave us to look after. So you've got those three stages. First, wars and rumors of wars, troubles, famines, earthquakes, etc. Secondly, the Great Tribulation. Thirdly, the summing of the Lord to the earth. In my judgment, we're already in stage one, which means that stage two is coming down the line to be followed by stage three. Now, the Bible tells us that behind all this, there are spiritual forces at work. When you talk to people in the world, 
they will say that it's all politics and they'll give you some reason for these things happening. If you look at the Bible, there's basically a war which is going on, which is a war between God and Satan. And God exists and Satan exists. Good angels exist and fallen angels exist called demons. They're there. People may argue against it, but they can argue as much as they like. Those powers are there. They exist. Good and evil, God and Satan. And both have their agenda, if you like, in the last day scenario. The powers of darkness, Satan, demons, want people to reject God, reject the gospel, take over their minds and their actions, and make them do the things which are going to push the world towards the Great Tribulation. And you can see that many of the leaders of the world clearly are definitely in the hands of Satan, doing the things which they're doing. Mr. Putin, Xi Jinping, the Islamists, Kim Jong-un in North Korea, and quite a lot in our own part of the world as well. And I would say a lot of our uh, New World Order in this part of the world is being motivated by evil spirits as well. So you've got demons and evil spirits working. Now you tell that to most people outside, they think you're joking. But if you understand the principles behind this, it's true, they are there. Same time, God is working to rescue people from calamity by coming to repentance and faith in Jesus, the Messiah, and spreading his message of truth and love to those who are filled with the Holy Spirit. So God has a program, and if you are a believer in Jesus, you're part of that program. God wants to use you as part of that program to spread the truth, the gospel message of Jesus Christ, and to rescue people from the powers of darkness, to bring them into the kingdom of God, and to give them a glorious future and a glorious hope. And no matter what I've just said about the bad stuff happening, it's only for a temporary time. The good stuff which is happening, which is going to, ca which is going to come, first of all, the thousand-year reign of the Messiah on the earth, and then the new heavens and the new earth in which we'll be there with him for eternity, are beyond any person's ability to destroy. In fact, Paul said in Corinthians that the eye hasn't seen, the ear hasn't heard, nor has it entered into the imagination of the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. In other words, uh, don't despair because you've got a wonderful future ahead of you. But you've only got a future ahead of you if you believe in Jesus. And this is what people kind of resist because they want to say, well, my God's as good as your God, and uh, I'm a good person, so I've got a good future. No, Jesus is the one who opens up the way. He's the door to eternal life. He's the way, the truth, and the life. He's the one who gives us that hope for the future. Now, God also says that there comes a point where he actually gives people over to evil and he gives them over to the results of their evil doings and uh, hands them over to their fate ultimately hell and judgment now according to Jeremiah 25 he's going to allow a cup of fury to be poured out on the nations which are rejecting him causing them to go mad I would say that's happening now as well but thus says the Lord God of Israel to me Take this wine cup of, my, of fury from my hand and cause all the nations to whom I send you to drink it. They will drink it and stagger and go mad because of the sword that I will send among them. Do you see any signs of madness in the world events today? I think so. You see people doing crazy things in power? Even some of the religious people are doing crazy things. It goes on to say, Now prophesy all these words against them and say a noise will come to the ends of the earth, the Lord has a controversy with the nations. He will plead his case with all flesh. And he will give those who are wicked to the sword, says the Lord. Thus says the Lord of hosts, Behold, disaster shall go forth from nation to nation, and a great whirlwind will be raised up from the furthest parts of the earth. At that day the slain of the Lord shall be from one end of the earth, even to the other end of the earth. They shall not be lamented or gathered or buried. They shall become refuse on the ground. Very solemn words. But God's saying there that there comes a point where God gives up on the people of the earth, and he allows them to be handed over to judgment and destruction. We're not there yet, but you can see the signs all around us, and they see the world heading in that direction. And notice it says there, the Lord has a controversy with the nations. God has a controversy with our nation. Uh, God is absolutely furious when he sees children being told that they can be homosexual and transsexual at school, and all that stuff which is happening, the kind of madness which is taking place. It's all part of the Antichrist demonic agenda and God has a controversy with the nations which are doing this when you come to believe in Jesus then the controversy is over because you're now on his side but until you're going against him you're part of that P2 
people were just going the wrong way. Now, the Bible also says that behind all this, there are demonic forces. Again, people don't like to think about the existence of Satan and demons, but the Bible is very clear that there is a power of evil which is working in the world today. Uh, in the passage in Revelation, which speaks about the final battle of Armageddon, uh, Revelation 16, verse 12, it says, Then the sixth angel poured his bowl on the great river Euphrates. Its water was dried up so that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. By the way, the waters of the Euphrates are already drying up. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs coming out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, out of the mouth of the false prophet. They are spirits of demons performing signs which go out to the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. Behold, I am coming as a thief. Blessed is he who watches and keeps his garments, lest he walk naked and see his shame. They gather them together to the place called in Hebrew Armageddon. Armageddon, mountain of Megiddo. Armageddon. Well, we're not yet at Armageddon, but the principle which is at work there is actually already at work. You can see the idea that demons are going out, causing people to go in the way which is contrary to God's will. And the people that reject God being prepared for the last battle before the second coming of Jesus. Also note that Jesus says, I'm coming as a thief. Blessed is he who watches and keeps his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. There's a blessing for those who believe in Jesus, even at the time of Armageddon. And there's a place for those who will put their trust in him. But there's a battle. There's a battle going on between good and evil. You can't get away from it. And it's manifested in our time. I gave a talk on this last week in Sunday morning, but I'll just mention this. To be safe, you need Jesus in your life. I spoke last week about Matthew chapter 8, uh, Jesus in the boat on the Galilee. It says, when he got into the boat, his disciples followed him, and suddenly a great tempest arose on the sea, so that the boat was covered with waves, but he was asleep. <clears throat> then his disciples came to him and awoke him, saying, Lord, save us, we are perishing. But he said to them, why are you fearful, O you of little faith? Then he arose and bebreaked the winds and the sea, and there was great calm. So the men marveled, saying, who can this be that even the wind and the sea obey him? I would say that collectively the human race is heading into a storm. We're like a, in a boat heading into a storm, and the winds and the waves are coming into the boat. And ultimately, they're going to cause this boat to sink. If you're in the boat and it's sinking, you're going to drown. And in this account in the Gospels, actually Jesus is in the boat, but he's asleep, and he's apparently unconcerned. So some people think that God's asleep, and he's unconcerned, and he's uh, not paying attention. Hopefully you're not asleep. If so, wake up, because God wants you to pay attention. But Jesus, actually, or even if he's asleep, he's still <laughs> Jesus, and he's still the Son of God, and he's still able to do something about it. So when the disciples wake him up and said, Lord, we're perishing, which they are, and we could say to Jesus, we, the human race, collectively, are heading on a way which is leading us towards perishing. Jesus, what are you going to do about it? And we see that Jesus just says, why are you fearful, o little you of little faith? He arose, rebuked the winds and the waves, and there was a great calm. So when Jesus is in the situation, he can just bring calm and peace. And when you look around the world today and you feel p troubled and you see people in trouble, what you need to do is have Jesus with you, speaking that word to bring peace and to bring calm. And they say, who can this be, that even the wind of the sea obey him? Well, he can only be God, can he? Interesting little bit of uh, technology here. Suppose people might say, well, it just so happened that the wind fell down at the same time. If the wind had stopped at the same time, would the waves have stopped at the same time? Would they? No because of what they call kinetic energy. The wind may drop suddenly, but the waves are still going to carry on because they've been stirred up by the wind and only after a l quite a long period of time will the waves actually drop. So the fact that the wind and the waves stopped at the same time could only have been done by the person who made the wind and the waves, who is God. So that's why they say, who can this be? Well, it has to be the Son of God. It has to be God himself. Now, if you've got Jesus in the boat with you, no matter how threatening the storm looks, and I'd have to say most people are unaware of it, but the storm is threatening. You need to have Jesus in the boat with you because the storm may break out here as well. 
You need to have Jesus in the boat with you so that he's with you and he can save you. He can save you from drowning, but more important, he can save your soul from being lost forever. That's why we need Jesus in the boat with us. And the disciples know that he's with us and that he's, he's with them. And so they experience suddenly a great calm. And I think that, you know, sometimes when I give these talks, people might be afraid and I don't want people to be afraid. I want them to be calm and at peace. So you've got to have Jesus in the boat. Now, to be honest, most of the world today has chucked Jesus off the boat and they don't want to know. That's why when they get into the storm, they're in a boat which is going to sink. Unfortunately, <laughs> unless they call on the Lord and ask him to come back into the boat with them. But we're living in a time when we need to be in a right relationship with God. We need to have Jesus in the boat with us to give us safety and to give us life as we go through this. Okay, so that's the kind of preamble I'm going to go on to Israel now. Let's have a look at the situation, what's happening in Israel. I have to say that November, uh, October the 7th was the most traumatic day. I can't begin to express what people in Israel must have felt. I felt it badly enough, and it didn't really affect me personally. If you're in Israel and suddenly you find that these terrorists have come into your country, into your homes, into your people, killed some 1,400 people, some with torture, beheading, great savagery, and taken some 200 plus people back into Gaza as hostages. Truly demonic actions were committed by Hamas, beheading babies, rape, abducting hostages as elderly and young people, young children. Uh, Israel was reeling from this. Also, there was an intelligence failure which has created a lot of anger in Israel at the failure. Why, didn't, why weren't they caught before they came in? Well, that's for the Israeli government to sort out, but it's an ongoing question. How could it possibly have happened? Also, at the same time, you had missiles, hundreds of missiles, thousands of maybe even missiles being fired into Israel, supplied by Iran, mostly shot down by the Iron Dome, which is Israel's amazing uh, technological device which fires down the missiles. You've got missiles there coming over Ashkelon. All those sparks there are missiles being shot down by the Iron Dome. And at the same time, you had the, pe the people breaking through the fence and massacring people in the kibbutzim and at the dance festival in the Gaza, in the desert. Now, because of this, Israelis felt a tremendous loss of security. Uh, there was a fear of what might happen if, God forbid, Israel were to lose a war with its neighbors. Fear of what might be coming on the land. And again, the Lord is the only hope. Um, Yesterday, Barbara rang up one of our friends who's uh, in Jerusalem. Turned out she was at a prayer gathering at Marcus Street Baptist Church in Jerusalem. Um, she told us that the Messianic congregations at the moment are doubling in size. Everyone's coming along to pray. I said at the prayer meeting at Narcus Street, they had just been reading Isaiah chapter 60. Arise, shine, for your light has come. The glory of the Lord is risen upon you. Behold, the darkness shall cover the earth and deep darkness the people, but the Lord will arise over you and his glory will be seen upon you. The Gentiles shall come to your light and the kings to the right, brightness of your rising. And the sun, also the sons of those who afflicted you shall come bowing down to you and all those who despise you shall prostrate to you at the soles of your feet. They shall call you the city of the Lord, Zion, the Holy One of Israel. Whereas you have been forsaken and hated so that no one went through you, I will make you an eternal excellence, the joy of many generations. You shall drink the milk of the Gentiles and the milk the breast of kings. You shall know that I, the Lord, am your Savior and your Redeemer, the Mighty One of Jacob. Praise the Lord, the Mighty One of Jacob, and your Savior and Redeemer. He's there. He hasn't given up. We've also spoken to Trevor Zucker, Yossi Avadia in Carmiel telling us about young people who've been drafted up into the army from their congregation in Carmiel, may by now be in the front line and ask us to pray for them, pray for their safety, pray that they'll be kept as they go into Gaza. Now, looking at this whole issue, Israel's not fighting to inflict harm on the Palestinians. It's actually fighting for its own survival. Uh, Joel Rosenberg, who's a writer, a Messianic Jew, interviewed a former lieutenant colonel in the IDF, 
intelligence. He's Jewish. He's not a believer in Yeshua. He told Joel, we're facing the end times and the end of Israel if we don't achieve a massive victory over the immense threats posed by Iran, Hezbollah, and Hamas. The, 9/11, the 7th of October attack has been compared to 9-11, also to the Holocaust. Also, what we're seeing is that at first there's a lot of sympathy for Israel, but now it's beginning to change. Israel's response, bombing Gaza, the ground offensive, now stirring up a great deal of anti-Zionist, anti-Semitic feelings around the world. Now, if you are a friend of Israel, you may feel grieved for Israel, but also we can feel grieved for the Palestinian Arabs, and I do. You see their homes being destroyed, being cut off from food, uh, some 7,000 killed, apparently, including 1,000 children. We should have compassion and concern for them as well, because God loves them, and God is concerned for them. However, responsibility for their plight, in my judgment, lies entirely with Hamas. Hamas hadn't attacked Israel. Israel would not have gone into Gaza. There's no desire to kill them, just wants to defend their people. And one has to say that international law does give Israel the right to remove a threat to its existence, therefore has a right to remove Hamas from power as they've demonstrated their aim in word and deed, which is to destroy Israel. Netanyahu gave a speech yesterday in which he talked about the triumph of good over evil, light over darkness, life over death. He said, may God bring salvation and victory to our troops. Quite interesting to use the word salvation. Uh, it's all translated from Hebrew into English, and I did listen out very carefully to the Hebrew, and it did say Yeshua. I thought, may he bring Yeshua to our troops, and may he indeed bring Yeshua, salvation, to our troops. However, the world doesn't see it that way. The world sees the devastation in Gaza, and it says that Israel is responsible. And one has to say that the two aims of the Israeli action are to eliminate Hamas and to bring back hostages. There aren't any easy answers since Hamas is embedded in the civilian population, puts missiles in homes, in flats, in schools, in hospitals, in mosques. And Israel does know and regrets the suffering of the people, the civilians. It does what it can to minimize civilian deaths. Unlike Hamas, it does what it can to increase civilian deaths. And it actually uses its civilians to shield its missiles. But one has to say that the suffering of the Arabs is creating sympathy for them and antipathy towards Israel. So what can they do? Should they back down, have a ceasefire? Problem is that gives victory to the terrorists and gives them the opportunity to rearm and encourage them to do more. Do they go in and try to eliminate Hamas, which is actually very difficult to do because you can kill some of the people, you can get rid of some of the sites, but you can't get rid of the idea. And unfortunately, as other Arabs see the suffering, they're likely to be more encouraged to join Hamas, which is already happening in the West Bank. And if there were elections in the West Bank, by the way, Hamas would probably take over there as well, which would add to Israel's problems. There's a great danger of the war spreading. <coughs> spreading. Somebody gets in the water. <laughs> uh, great danger of the war spreading. Hezbollah said that if Israel starts a ground invasion of Gaza, it will pay a severe price. Hezbollah in the north in Lebanon has 150,000 missiles supplied by Iran. It's much stronger than Hamas. If, even if it links, just launches 25,000 missiles... Iron Dome would get 90% of them, but 10,000 would get through. That's 2,500 missiles, which could cause great devastation in the land of Israel. There are some in the IDF who are saying that Israel should actually make a preemptive strike and knock the missiles out before they can be used. Uh, America would certainly be against that idea. America is trying to restrain uh, such actions, and I think it's unlikely to happen. Uh, Israel's given a warning to Hezbollah that if they do launch missiles against them, they would devastate Lebanon, and they would be well able to do this. In fact, the non-Hezbollah forces in Lebanon 
have been begging Hezbollah not to start a war for Israel because they know what damage it would do to their own country, already in great strife, great uh, difficulty because of its economic crisis, largely caused by uh, Iran and Hezbollah, by the way. Iran and Hezbollah have caused misery not just to Israel but to all the Arab countries which they've gone into. Uh, Israel has also given a warning that if there is an attack, they would attack Damascus. In fact, they're already attacking Damascus airport. In fact, they said they might destroy Damascus, <laughs> which if you know Isaiah 17, there's a verse which says that Damascus should be a, a ruinous heap and will not be inhabited again. Amir Safati, um, Israeli believer, wrote, Hezbollah has 100,000 suicide bomb bombers prepared to cross Israel's northern border these are terrorists brainwashed in a culture and religion that celebrates death. This zombie-like horde is entitledly anticipating their opportunity to invade Israel so they can kill Jews and become martyrs of Allah. How must our culture, which loves and respects life, confront such a violent death cult? He says, with devastating force, our military can't worry about... What our words our military can't worry about in times such as these are proportionality, moderation, and compromise. Now, behind all this, there are demonic forces which are being unleashed, not just in this war, but around the world. I've already said this. How do you explain the savagery of Hamas, the torturing, the decapitating of babies, except by the evidence of demonic powers behind them? One of the interesting things which has come out, I haven't heard about it in the news, but in the sort of news behind the news, which I get hold of, is that Israel discovered what they called captagon tablets on the bodies of terrorists killed in the action. These pills were discovered from the pockets of many terrorists who lost their lives on the Israeli soil. The stimulant drug allowed the terrorists to commit heinous acts with a sense of calmness and indifference. Simultaneously, it kept them highly alert for contagion for extended periods and suppressed their appetite and provided sustained energy. Captagon was used by ISIS fighters to suppress fear prior to carrying out terrorist operations. Apparently, this drug is being spread by factories in Lebanon and Syria, producing the drug and spreading it around the Middle East, also exporting it to Saudi Arabia. What you're seeing here actually is a Saudi official intercepting 5 million Captagon pills being smuggled via Lebanon in imported pomegranates. Saudi Arabia is very worried about this because they can see it corrupting their own people, and they're putting pressure on Lebanon and Syria to stop producing it. But it's big business in those countries. It's funded by the government, even Assad's brother, uh, the leader of uh, Syria, is involved in the production and the distribution of these tablets. They're used to make people do horrible things. What's behind it? The devil. It's all part of the devil's system. In Revelation chapter 9, it says, the rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues did not repent of the works of their hands that they should not worship demons and idols of gold, silver, brass, stone, and wood, which can neither see nor walk. They did not repent of their murders or their sorceries or their sexual immorality or their thefts. The word for sorcerers in that passage is pharmakia, which also means drugs. But one of the things we're going to see is drug taking affecting people's mentalities. Happening here in America, around the world, South America, getting drugs into the States. And one of the effects of taking drugs is you get into an altered state of consciousness. In the altered state of consciousness, then the devil can put thoughts into your mind which are anti-Christ and anti-God. The only time I ever took hash was when I was in Istanbul and a Dutch girl came and gave it to me and I sat down on the water pump taking hashish and immediately it came into my thoughts some blasphemous thoughts about Jesus. <laughs> Where did that come from? It's part of what's behind it. And Satan's behind all this to make people do things which are evil in the sight of the Lord. At the center of all of this is Iran. The Islamist regime has spent many years and countless dollars recruiting, training, and arming th thousands upon thousands of terrorist warriors in, a, in their proxy militias, mostly located in Iraq and Syria. Also extend to Yemen, southwest and Hamas, Islamic Jihad, and Hezbollah. The ultimate goal of Iran and thus of the militias is the destruction of Israel and the eradication of the Jews. That's why it's very frustrating that just uh, last month, the U.S. administration released $6 billion to Tehran. Incredibly stupid act. That money will be spent on war, not on, will not be spent on the welfare of the Iranian people, be funneled into equipping terrorists 
want to do more of what we saw take place on October the 7th. One of the questions which you might ask is, why is Iran so hostile to Israel? Got no border with Israel, not been involved in any of the wars over Israel, it's over a thousand miles away. Previous to the Islamic Revolution in 1979, Persia, Iran was, uh, was friendly to Israel under the Shah. Previously to the revolution, the Persian form of Islam was quite moderate and tolerant of Jews and minorities. And today, many Iranians are incensed that their government is wasting money which should be used for the benefit of the Iranian people on worthless terrorists like Hamas and Hezbollah. But actually, what the reason is that they're motivated by their religion, motivated by something called the Mahdi, the myth of the Mahdi, whom they believe is going to usher in the last day's war. This is only some uh, Muslims, not all Muslims believe this, but the fanatic, the hardline people, and it's one of the motivations behind the Islamic revolution in Iran. They believe some story that the hidden imam called the Muhammad al-Mahdi was hidden in a cave in the year 874. The son of the 11th imam went into hiding at the age of six years old in a mosque in Samarra in Iraq. That's where it is. It's actually not in Iran, it's in Iraq. But they're all Shiite Muslims as well. The cave is blocked by a gate called the Sh which the Shia call Bab al-Gaibah, or the Gate of Occ Occultation. One of the most sacred sites of Shia Islam, the faith will gather here to pray for the return of the 12th Imam. The occultation or hiding of the Mahdi will end with his return to the world for the last judgment. The period will be marked by violent upheavals, attacks upon the faithful. In the end, the Mahdi will deliver the world to peace and judge the world for its crimes, ushering in an era of perfect worship and governance. Does that sound like a crazy story to you? Yeah, but people believe it. People believe all sorts of crazy stories. And this confused end time scenario is not found in the Quran based on traditions which have become part of this form of Islam. Some of them taking actually by twisting parts of the Bible. Also includes the arrival of one they call Isa al-Masih. Isa al-Masih translated as Jesus the Messiah. But it's not our Jesus. It's another Jesus. According to this tradition, Isa al-Masih descends and destroys all crosses, converts Christians from sins against Allah, and kills all Christians and others who can refuse to convert to Islam. And this battle, it also speaks about an apocalyptic battle which will occur in the land of Israel, uh, north of Israel, in the land of Magog, sorry. During the reign of the final caliph, the Mahdi will then rule over all Islam. It says the Mahdi wears a crown while on a white horse, matching Revelation 6 verse 2. With the help of Isa al-Masih, he will defeat the Dajjal, which is the Muslim version of the Antichrist, resulting in a world where Islam finally is the only religion, all other religions being banished from the face of the earth. This false teaching, inspired by demons, pushing the world in the direction of Armageddon. Interestingly, in our interpretation of Revelation 6, the one riding on the white horse is not the Lord Jesus Christ, it's the Antichrist. Jesus is actually riding on the white horse in Revelation 19, which happens at Armageddon. So you've got this. This is one of the reasons why the Iranians are so much against Israel. Not all Iranians, but I haven't met a single Iranian here who holds this view. Most of them actually despise it. But it's the view which is behind Khomeini and behind the Islamic revolution which followed him. Now, as a result of what's happening, you're seeing a anti-Israel movement all around the world. You notice that in London yesterday, and the week before, and the week before, hundreds of thousands of people marching through London saying, Palestine will be free. From the river to the sea, Palestine will be free. Palestine will be free. What does that mean? Where's the river? There's the river Jordan. There's the sea, the Mediterranean. What's in between the Jordan and the sea? Israel what they call the West Bank, Gaza. All of that, they say, is going to be one place which will be called Palestine. 
So when you hear people saying, from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free, as people are doing there, uh, they're not talking about setting up a Palestinian state alongside Israel. They're talking about setting up a Palestinian state in place of Israel. Now, what you're seeing today is our media, even the UN, is also getting on side with the other side. Secretary General Antonio Guterres said the Hamas attacks didn't happen in a vacuum, went on to give justification to it by saying that Palestinians are living under a suffocating occupation and basically you could say even justifying it. Our media is quick to blame Israel for the attacks, uh, even the hospital attack, you noticed that one last week, what was it? Um, said that Israel bombed the uh, hospital, everyone was blaming Israel. Then they did some research and found out that the missile had come from Gaza and was fired by their own side on their own people and yet the media was slow to give any answer to it. And you're seeing all kinds of anti-Semitic things coming out now. Uh, Anti-Israel, anti-Semitic, and attacks on Jewish people. And as believers in Jesus, we need to be very much standing by Israel and by the Jewish people and standing against those who are coming to attack them. Some are even coming from so-called Christian sources. Uh, I watched a film which I got on the internet from a group called Stop the World Control. Anybody come across Stop the World Control? Very anti-New uh, World Order. Got a lot of stuff against COVID, against all the globalization and all that stuff, some of which actually I almost agree with. But also they have a very strong anti-Semitic, anti-Zionist side to them. And I watched this film called uh, About Israel, which had all the old tropes of Zionists wanting to control the world, protocols of the elders of Zion, all that stuff was in it. And Israel is the result of a Jewish conspiracy through a globalist plot by the Rothschilds trying to control the world. It was horrible. I sent them an article, I sent them a response to it, but I haven't had any reply yet. And you're seeing this anti-Israel, anti-Jewish thing which is rising. And you're seeing people marching through the streets of London and Paris saying death to the Jews. The government's trying to deal with it, but... The problem is that their ideology has been brought in and Europe is waking up to the truth that there are many within our countries that want to overturn our governments, replace them with Sharia law. And we see this union of Islamists plus the left, leftists who are against Israel, plus some old-fashioned anti-Semites anti all coming together to fight against Israel. And it's very dangerous, and it's going to could even bring bloodshed to the streets here. Now, we looked uh, previously at Psalm 83. Uh, Psalm 83 uh, says, amongst other things, Behold, your enemies make a tumult. Those who hate you have lifted up their head. They've taken crafty counsel against your people and cons consulted together against your sheltered ones. They've said, Come, let us sh cut them off from being a nation that the name of Israel may be remembered no more. Some people say this is a prophecy of the last days. Some people say it's just a statement of the attitude of the surrounding nations to Israel. Could be both. But notice what they say here. Come, let us cut them off from being a nation that the name of Israel may be remembered no more. That's exactly what Hamas is saying, what all the people are gathering to say. They say they want Israel to be cut off from being a nation, its name to be remembered no more. Drive it into the sea. From the river to the sea, Palestine shall be free. No more Israel. Cut it off. You also have Ezekiel 38. Mentioned this as well before. Now, I don't believe we are actually in the Gog and Magog war at the present time, but it could lead up to it. In the Gog and Magog war, it says that there's going to be a coming of a power coming down from the north against Israel. <coughs> uh, Ezekiel 38, verse 1, it says, Now the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, set your face against Gog of the land of Magog, the prince of Rosh, Meshech, and Tubal. Prophesy against him and say, Thus says the Lord, God, behold, I'm against you, O Gog, the prince of Rosh, Meshech, and Tubal. I will turn you around, put hooks in your jaws, and lead you out with all your army. Then in verse 8, it says, In the latter years you'll come into the land of those brought back from the sword, gathered from many peoples, on the mountains of Israel, which had long been desolate, they were brought out of the nations, and now all of them dwell safely. You shall ascend like a storm, 
co covering the land like a cloud, you and all your troops and many peoples with you. So that army comes down from the north, led by a great power from the north. Could identify that with Russia. At the present time, Russia seems to be a bit tied up with Ukraine, but could be. Certainly, Persia is mentioned, which is Iran, to Gama, which could be Turkey, and other powers which could come into the collective army coming against Israel. The invasion begins, it says, particularly at a time when Israel is restored uh, and is living in the land. And it says specifically it'll be in the latter days. So if we believe we're living in the latter days, this could be something which is on the way. One of the problems, it says, that Israel is dwelling securely. Well, Israel clearly isn't dwelling to securely at the present time. But the word for securely actually is betach in Hebrew, which means with security. So it could be that Israel sets up after this war some kind of security system in which they are, for a while, safe from attack. It could be also there is some kind of a peace agreement along the lines of Daniel chapter 9. Before that, we shall see. But whatever it is, when this army comes against Israel, it's going to be decisively destroyed by the Lord. Okay, I'm just going through this quickly because time's going on. We also have Zechariah chapter 12 to 14. Zechariah chapter 12, it says, Behold, I make Jerusalem a cup of drunkenness to all the surrounding peoples that will lay siege against Judah and Jerusalem. It shall come to happen in that day that I will make Jerusalem a very heavy stone for all peoples, or a burdensome stone for all peoples, all who would heave it away will surely be cut in pieces, though all nations of the earth are gathered against it. That prophecy says there's going to come a time at the end when Jerusalem is going to be a focus of attention for the surrounding peoples, in other words, the people of Israel and the Arab peoples, and for all the nations of the earth. In other words, the UN, United States, Russia, EU, China, all those people are going to have something to say about Jerusalem. <coughs> Do you see that happening? Is that the situation today? Jerusalem is the burdensome stone. It's the heart of the agenda. Who rules over this place here? Whose hand should it be in? Should it be the undivided capital of Israel? Should it be divided into the capital of Israel and Palestine? Should it be some kind of internationalized place which is ruled by the UN? Those are some of the options which are before us. But whatever, you're shaking your heads, well... <laughs> I'm not giving you the answer, but whatever, we can see that this is a question which is on the agenda of the world community. Just what the Bible says is going to happen in the last days. <clears throat> then in chapter 14, it says, I will gather all nations to battle against Jerusalem. The last battle is going to be over Jerusalem. Then a few verses down, it says, Then the Lord will go forth and fight against those nations as he fights in the day of battle. And in that day, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, which faces Jerusalem to the east. In other words, when this battle comes against Jerusalem, then the Lord is going to come and stand on the Mount of Olives to the east of Jerusalem. Interestingly, that Yeshua, when he arose, when he ascended into heaven, arose from the Mount of Olives on the east of Jerusalem. Interestingly, he is the Lord who has appeared in a body. This one's going to appear in a body. He's got feet, so he's got the rest of a body. So the Lord is going to come and appear in a body and stand on the Mount of Olives at the end of days and then proclaim the establishment of the kingdom of God through Israel and Jerusalem and put an end to all the enemies against him. Can you see it happening? Yeah, I think so. Now, it's interesting that Jerusalem is the central point of world attention. <clears throat> One of the things which the people on our side, that's the UK, the EU, and United States who have been one has to say, from the governmental point of view, supportive of Israel up to this time, one of the things they've said is that when this is all over, Israel must move towards a two-state solution. Uh, after Rishi Sunak came back from his tour of the Middle East, he said that uh, there were three things he'd learned that have to be done. One is humanitarian aid has to be given to Gaza. Two, they have to give support for a two-state solution. And three, they have to prevent escalation into Hezbollah and other countries. And to do this, he said, he repeated himself, you have to invest in the two-state solution. Now, if you look at the two-state solution, it means actually that Israel will be divided and the status of Jerusalem will be determined. 
either as the capital of Israel or the capital of Palestine. They would like it to be the capital of Palestine. And they would like the Palestinian Authority to take over what they call the West Bank or Judea and Samaria, the biblical heartland of Israel, where currently some 500,000 Jews live in the settlements. <coughs> Present time, one has to say that this issue is irreconcilable because Israel has its agenda, Palestinians have their agenda, and they're two totally separate, just as the Bible says. But it does appear that from the Bible that there will be some kind of settlement, but it won't uh, work for good for Israel. Just to give you a little bit of history, okay, historically, Israel has accepted in the past a two-state proposal. 1947, the UN voted to partition British Mandate Palestine into two states, one Arab and one Jewish, with Jerusalem placed under a special international regime. 1948, the State of Israel was proclaimed. The Jews accepted the two-state idea. They weren't pretty happy about it, but they accepted it. The Arabs rejected it in what was called the War of Independence. <coughs> Israel won that war, and the border was fixed at the ceasefire lines, which ended up giving what they called the West Bank to Jordan and Gaza to Egypt. At no point during that time did the West Bankers ever ask that they should be an independent state of Palestine, nor did Gaza ask to be an independent state of Palestine either. In 1967, you had the Six-Day War in which Israel defeated combined Arab armies, which came to destroy them, and the West Bank, <coughs> Jerusalem, Gaza, Sinai, and the Golan Heights all came to Israel. Amazing victory in six days. Israel took control of those areas. Interestingly, the year later, in 1968, Israel offered to give them all back, all the territories back, in return for a comprehensive peace treaty with their neighbors, in which they would set up an agreement. They wouldn't attack them again. They'd live in peace within the borders which they have now had. 1968, the Arabs had a conference called the Khartoum Conference, in which they made the three no's. No peace, no negotiations, no recognition of Israel. So a big no from the Arab world. 1964, going back a couple, three years, the Palestine Liberation Organization, or the PLO, was formed. <coughs> Dominant group was Fatah, which is now the party behind the Palestinian Authority, party of Mahmoud Abbas, who is in charge of the Palestinian Authority. Its aim was to liberate Palestine. Now, what part of Palestine did they want to liberate? West Bank, no, that was part of Jordan. Gaza, no, that was part of Egypt. So what part of Palestine was left? Israel. So the PLO was formed to, actually to exterminate Israel. To end Israel, and <coughs> that was their aim. There weren't any settlements, there was no Jewish presence in, Jeru in the old city of Jerusalem. In fact, all Jews had been expelled from the historic Jewish quarter in 1948 by the Jordanians. And they wanted to liberate Israel and turn it into Palestine. 1973, you had the uh, Yom Kippur War, a surprise attack by Egypt and Syria on the Day of Atonement. Interestingly, it was at the same time in our calendar as this event which took place the Yom Kippur War happened actually on October the 6th, 1973. This one happened on October the 7th, 2023. That time it was the festival, of the fast, sorry, of Yom Kippur. This time it was the end of the Feast of Tabernacles. Surprise attack, which at one point it looked like Israel was going to be overrun by Syria and Egypt. But uh, Israel was saved a lot of prayer. By this time, I was a Christian, and we were having prayer meetings uh, for Israel, linked up with prayer for Israel. Lance Lambert was, had his famous prayer meetings in Jerusalem in which they prayed for Israel's protection, prayed that confusion would come upon the enemies and that Israel would be saved. Also, the United States stepped in and sent a great deal of uh, weapons to Israel to save them from destruction. Another interesting story about that one, actually, Golda Meir rang up President Nixon, 
at the time of Watergate, when he was in big trouble, about to lose his presidency, and Golda Meir said, we need equipment, we need tanks, we need shells, we need everything to fall, uh, otherwise Israel's going to be overrun. Nixon had been told by his mother, who was a believing Christian, that at some time, if he was ever in a position where he could help Israel or the Jewish people, he must do it. Remember what his mother did, said, and he did it more than what Golda asked for. Gave a huge amount of munitions which saved Israel and which were transported just in time to push back the Syrians. And at the end of the war, Israel was on the road to Damascus and on the road to Cairo in the south. An amazing victory. Interesting little detail which people don't know so much about. Uh, wait a minute, I've been to the wrong one here. Yeah, here. 1974, a year afterwards, the PLO adopted what they called the 10 points phase policy. They decided that the Arabs were not going to defeat Israel in battle, so they had to adopt a new policy, which was what they called the phase policy. The phase policy said that they would campaign to have any part of territory which Israel chose to withdraw from. They would set up their authority there. They would use that territory then to dismantle what remained of Israel. See anything like that happening? 1979, you had the Israel-Egypt peace treaty, which Israel gave back the Sinai. And then in 1993, we had the Oslo Accords. Israel made an agreement with the Palestinian, with the PLO. Uh, <coughs> Yasser, uh, Yasser Arafat met with Yitzhak Rabin, the Prime Minister of Israel, with Bill Clinton in America, and they signed a peace treaty or an agreement, if you like, not a peace treaty so much. The agreement was that Jericho, Gaza and Jericho would go first to the Palestinian control, then it would be extended. Palestinian Authority would be set up with control over expanding area of the West Bank and Gaza. They'd have elections for representatives of the Palestinian Authority. And following that, Israel actually offered most of the West Bank and Jerusalem to the Palestinians in 2000 and 2008. Both occasions they were refused. 2000, Arafat refused because he didn't get all of Jerusalem. He wanted the whole place. Israel said, we're gonna hang on to the Jewish quarter. Uh, so he launched the Intifada, uh, which, in which about 1,000 Jews were killed in terrorism, which resulted in the separation wall being put up between is Israel and the Palestinian areas. 2008, Ehud Barak, er Ehud Olmert, offered even more. Again, it was refused. <clears throat> 2005, Israel pulled out of Gaza. 2006, Gaza, uh, there was an election in the Palestinian Authority area, which, in fact, Hamas won, but the Palestinian Authority put them down and uh, said, no, we're going to have our person as prime minister. Led to a conflict in Gaza between the Palestinian Authority and Hamas, which Hamas won. And from that point onward, Hamas has ruled over Gaza. Palestinian Authority, Fatah, has ruled over the West Bank. From 2007 to 2014, there was sporadic rocket fire from Gaza into Israel. Israel responded. 2014, there was a full-scale war, which was called Operation Protective Edge, in which Israel went into Gaza. And from... Then onwards, up until the current time, there's been sporadic conflicts over Gaza. Also been the attempts to make a two-state solution with the Americans, with uh, Bill Clinton, then with, no, not with Bill Clinton, with uh, Barack Obama, then with uh, Donald Trump, trying to make agreements with the Palestinians, neither of which have worked. All this time, Israel has actually been open to the idea, but also has been increasingly suspicious and saying it's not going to work. We're not going to go for a two-state solution because it's too much of a danger to us. We know that if we can pull out of the West Bank, as we did out of Gaza, they're going to use it for the same purpose and dismantle what remains of Israel. That's why the two-state solution is, okay, it sounds all right in theory, but in practice, it's not going to work. But all of our governments are saying that Israel has to submit to it. Yes, Arafat, quite an evil man, very evil man, 
He said, our basic aim is to liberate the land from the Mediterranean Sea to the Jordan River. We're not concerned with what take place, took place in June 67 or eliminating the consequences of the Six-Day War. The Palestinian revolution's concern is the uprooting of the Zionist entity from our land and liberating it. Okay, so basically, he's always wanted basically the end of Israel. Now, I'm telling you this because today you've got a sort of idea that the Palestinians are divided into bad guys Hamas, good guys Fatah, and the PLO, or the Palestinian Authority. There are different stages of bad, but both of them actually want the elimination of Israel. That's why the two-state solution is an on-go at the present time. Did they ever mean to have a peace with Israel? It's debatable. Present time, the Palestinian Authority supports terrorism against Israel. It calls for tax on Israel. Uh, just this month, the Palestinian Authority uh, issued a call to all of its mosques, must teach that the extermination of Jews is an Islamic imperative. The PA Ministry of Religious Affairs posted guidelines for mosque preachers on Thursday, instructing preachers what content they should include in their Friday sermons. The most horrific part of the instructions was a quote from a hadith and Islamic tradition attributed to Muhammad that teaches that the end of time, the redemption of humanity is contingent upon Muslims killing and eventually exterminating Jews. The hour of resurrection will not come until the Muslims fight and the Jews and kill them, until the Jews hide behind the rocks and trees or the rock and the tree will say, Muslim, O servant of Allah, there's a Jew behind me, come and kill him except the Garkad tree, for it is the tree of the Jews. So how do you make peace with people like that? Big question. Can Israel survive this one? Its enemies are now heavily armed. They know that if they can agree to some kind of Palestinian state, it won't bring peace to Israel. Now, Zechariah tells us that this is going to be the last battle over Jerusalem. Can you see it shaping up? Hopefully you're not too bored with this historical bit, but it's telling you what is happening and why it's leading up to the last day's battle. It will end with the return of the Messiah, then he will return, and he will return to Jerusalem, and he will rule the world from Jerusalem, which is what uh, Isaiah says, what Zechariah says, and what is also written in Revelation chapter 20. There will then be peace and safety for all believers in the millennial kingdom, and it's coming. Praise the Lord. Just to wrap up, there's going to be a last day's crisis. Jesus said Jerusalem will be trodden down of the Gentiles, chapter 21 of Luke, verse 25. Jerusalem will be trodden down of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. There'll be signs in the sun, in the moon, and in the stars, on the earth, distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts fading them from fear and the expectation of those things which are coming on the earth for the powers of the heavens will be shaken Jerusalem is central to the world crisis the word with perplexity actually means with no way out it's aporia in Greek so you're going to have a crisis with no way out the Jerusalem issue which I've told you about is a crisis with no way out there's no real solution to it all of these other crises which are growing in the world, don't have a human solution. Only the Lord can sort them out. And he will sort them out. The Bible actually teaches us that the beast or the Antichrist will come and have his go to try and work it out. But it erodes in the last days of crisis. It won't lead to peace and safety, but to a time of great tribulation. Those who believe in Jesus shouldn't panic, but look up and lift up our heads because our redemption is drawing near. Jesus is coming. Some stage in all of this, the rapture of the church is going to happen. If you're an optimist before the tribulation, if you're a pessimist at the end of it, but it's going to happen. It says the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise. Then we who remain will be caught up together with him, with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Thus we should also be, always be with the Lord. Therefore comfort one another with these words there's a great comfort if you know Jesus because you know that you're on the winning side you know he's going to have a solution to all of this and there's a day coming we're going to take all the believers out of this world to meet with him in the air I think there's good evidence that it is before the tribulation 
I'm not going to get into that one in detail at this time. Whatever it is, you've got to be ready. And you've got to be ready to meet with the Lord. And the conclusion in Revelation 11, it says, The seventh angel sounded his trumpet, and there were loud voices from heaven, which said, The kingdom of this world has become the kingdom of our God, and of his Christ, his Messiah, and he will reign forever and ever. The end time program is going to lead to the second coming of Jesus, as Jesus is going to reign over the earth forever and ever. Well, not, no, actually, he's going to reign over the earth for a thousand years, then over the new heavens and new earth forever and ever. And if you believe in Jesus, you've got a part in that. Praise the Lord. So what are you going to do about it? Well, in the meantime, make sure you've got Jesus in the boat with you. <laughs> Commit your life to him and follow him. And just another couple of verses from Matthew chapter 7. Be on the road that leads to life. Matthew 7. Verse 13. Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many are those who go in by it. Narrow is the gate, and difficult is the way which leads to life, and there are few that find it. Get on the narrow road. It may be more difficult. You're going against the flow, but you're going on the way to heaven and to eternal life. Get off the broad road because it's leading to destruction. Verse 22, he says, Many will say to me in that day, No, verse 15, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing. Inwardly they are ravenous wolves. wolves. Do you not know them by their fruits? Do, not, do men gather grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Every good tree bears good fruit. A bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear good fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Every good tree, every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Therefore, by their fruits you shall know them. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. So make sure that you do the will of your Father in heaven. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And believe the true prophets of God, the word of God, not all the false prophets who are around. Especially don't believe in Muhammad because he's the key false prophet. And there are many, many false prophets, many false prophets inside the church and outside of it. Check them out by the word of God. And finally, in verse 24, he says, Everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, and it did not fall, for it was founded on the rock. Everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, and it fell, and great was its fall. You've got two roads, one leading to life, one leading to death. Two kinds of prophets, false prophets and true prophets, and two kinds of houses, one built on the rock which will stand and one built on the sand which will fall. You know which one you're in. Make sure you're in the good house and on the good road and listening to the good prophets and you're on the road to life because Jesus loves you. He wants to give you eternal life. He wants to give you security and peace in the midst of all this troubled world. And he wants to give peace and security also to Israel. And in the end, Israel has to look to Yeshua, to Jesus the Messiah, not to the rabbis, not to the New Age gurus or anything else, but to look to Yeshua as the only one who can give them peace and security and the hope of eternal life. And we pray that in these times that God will open up his heart, open up the way to many Jewish people to call upon the name of Yeshua, Jesus the Messiah, and find eternal life in him. Praise the Lord. Jesus is coming. Jesus is Lord. This is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel, says the Lord. I will put my law in their minds, write it on their hearts. I will be their God. They shall be my people. I will forgive their iniquity and their sin I will remember no more. That's God's promise. It's a promise which will come through Yeshua, Jesus the Messiah. Amen. Amen. Let's just have a word of prayer. And then we'll sing our final hymn. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the truth of your word. We thank you for the hope we have in Yeshua, the Messiah. As we see all these things happening in the world around us, help us to lift up our eyes to you and to know that you are the hope of Israel, 
the hope of the world, one who's given us life through your name, and the one who can bring calm in the midst of the storm and peace in the midst of war and hope in the midst of despair. We thank you that all this is available through our Lord Yeshua the Messiah. Amen. Amen. Anybody wants to ask me any questions, I think we'll do it afterwards informally, but come and ask me. And anyone wants prayer for any need, be happy to pray with you. Okay, we're going to sing our last hymn.